And if that attitude ain't there, then the process to which we are transformed is going to fail. And, and, and it's the same thing that Peter said when I quoted this morning in 1 Peter 2, where he says that we are to lay aside all malice and, super, and, and malice and evil speaking and, 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 and receive the word, the sincere milk of the word. So the, so the thing that keeps us from receiving the understanding is all of the malice and all of that stuff. So all of that got to be moved out of the way in order for the transformation process to take place. And finally on that, the, all I want to bring on that, is if you come to 1 Corinthians, quickly now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now this is going to be a real challenge to the psyche. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm just trying to let you know that uh, these are the steps by which we go through in order to start the transformation process. We have to recognize that God's Word is in fact God talking to us. Man. Number two, we've got to lay aside all of the ways, and you know, even in the world, they know when they, they know they got to stop drinking and cussing and all, they know that. And they said, well, I, I know I got to stop. Yeah, but I ain't ready. Well, see, you got to get ready. And so a person has to make up their minds. Are you want to go to heaven or not? And if you do, you got to stop everything that's wrong. And then, of course, you got to humble ourselves to the book and receive with meekness the exact word. Now, the third one now, the last one is, is that in 1 Corinthians 3, now this is going to pay, take a lot it's going to take a lot uh, of doing here because of what it says. But it, nevertheless, we got to do it. And what is it that we've got to do? He says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse number 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a what? A fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Mm -hmm. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or the world of life or death. All are things present, are things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God. Stay in there, come down to chapter 4, and verse number number uh, number 10. Look at what Paul continues with this thought. So, the big thing is, we must become, we must become fools. Fools for Christ. Yeah, that's going to strip all of my dignity of who I think I am. I'm a fool. And you are a fool. And you know what a fool is? A fool don't question. We don't question God. <laughs> we, if, and after we have rightly divided, if it says it, it is so. And a fool is a person who is not going to question his master. And to see myself and to see yourself as a fool is what we have to do in the process to where we can put ourselves in a position to change our ways and become productive Christians. Is I have to see myself as helpless without God. I must recognize I am nothing without God. And God is everything. So I've got to strip all of my pride and all of that pump and what that goes with this life and see myself as a fool for Christ. Because you see, I'll get to that in a minute. Paul says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even until this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and naked and abundant and have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our own hands, being reviled and blessed, being persecuted and suffering, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offspring of all things until this day. 
I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. Well, Paul, you are a fool for Christ. And if I'm going to follow you, that means I got to become a fool for Christ. And a fool is, the, is the, I know how that looks, but you see, if we're not a fool for Christ, we're a fool for the devil. And for a person to put themselves through all of this, you've got to be a fool. One more on this and I'm moving on to Luke because I know my time. Come to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 through about 9. Quickly now, 1 Peter chapter, and why am I going there? Because I'm talking about being a fool. And I'm going to show you, you sure enough got to be a fool. We are fools. That don't even sound good, huh? Fools for Christ. We already called fanatics. No, I ain't talking about being crazy. This is being a fool in the six. Oh, think of that. You know, you don't fall sitting here with all these degrees and that don't mean nothing. Got to leave all that out the door. And people sometimes think you got to be crazy to believe that there's only one church. That's because you and I are fool for this book which says there's only one church. One church. And you, when we walk down the alley, when I go down Beacon there, I see all these other churches there. But the book says there was one. And we walk by faith, not by sight. If I walk by sight, I see them all over the place. But when I walk by faith, faith only speaks of one church. They were one. So do we trust our eyesight or do we trust the book? You trust in the book, then you are a fool to the book, and so am I. And our efforts is to grow into being a bigger fool for the book. Because in being a fool for the book, you're being wise Amen. unto salvation. Amen. Amen. Now look at Peter, and I'm moving on now. He says in verse 3, Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, have begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance uncorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice Though now for a season it be, be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Look inside. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with what fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believe, ye are rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's what the end of your faith and my faith produces the salvation of our soul. But this is describing a fool. You and I are in love with Christ and we haven't seen him. Yeah. You and I are growing in greater love for our God. Yes. And we haven't heard him speak audible. So you know you and I show enough. Gotta be a fool for believing and loving someone we haven't even seen. And it takes a fool to do this. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God put it like this. So that nobody won't, nobody won't glory in his, in his presence. We got to stoop down right. and humble ourselves right. to this book. Right. If we're going to be saved. Nobody walks us in here and it's like they arrived. We all got to come down and come up to the book. So then, we have 
doctor, and that's where people question, oh, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ because one day I was sick and the Lord healed me. Uh-huh. Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ because I was in an accident. And uh, I didn't have no friends. And they said I had the whole car was told to walk away from it. Uh-huh. But people that don't believe in Jesus Christ can tell you about testimonies like that. So what is the reason for you believing in Jesus Christ? Because it is written. All right. And that's the reason why. And that, 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 that kills human reasoning. We believe in Christ because it is written. Period. Because Jesus in John 17, 20, prayed for, not only did I pray for them, but for those that will believe on me through their word. So that's the reason why we believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Haven't seen Jesus Christ. Don't know what he looked like. But you and I love him. And we're growing greater love in him because of what's written. Yeah. So that's being a fool. We're taking God at his word. We're not questioning him. We're rightly dividing it. We're steady studying it. And when we rightly divide and study it, we keep studying it to make sure. Because we never get too sure. Because we know that one day he's going to call us in death. And we want to be found as a fool for the Lord. Because the end of this is salvation. Now, now, once we know that now, once we know that by obeying the word of God, and, 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 and we know that be filled with the Spirit is a commandment, and we know that it takes transformation of our minds to do that, and, and the steps for transformation is, is what I just went over. Now we can move in and move on now to what exactly then does Luke 11, 13 says. Turn that quickly. Luke 11 and verse 13. Since, since, since we can't pray since you just told us that the Bible says that we are to obey, the or being filled with the Spirit is a is a commandment to obey, then what does what does Luke 11 13 teach? Well we need to go there and see. Because in Luke 11 and 13, I believe this morning when it was read, uh, in verse 9, Luke 11, 9, he says, I said to you, ask, and it shall be given. See. Ye shall find not, it shall be open unto you. And everyone that asketh is receiving it. And he that seeketh find it. And him that knocketh it shall be open. And the son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father. Will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. And this is where we got all into all those other things. Because if this verse is teaching that we can ask God for the Holy Spirit and God sends his bestowal upon us, no. No. Well, what is it? Well, go over to Matthew. Go over to Matthew uh, chapter 7 and verse number 11. The main verses for it. Matthew 7 and verse 11. And this is where people are thinking that you're stopping them off. Well, let's go over the sign. Let's just pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And where are you getting that from? Well, see, right here in Luke 11 13, it says pray for the Spirit and get God to send it. Well, now let's just see if that's really what that's saying. If you look at Matthew 7, which is made in verses to that, look at verse 11. It's the same thing, only there's a slight change. In verse number 11, which is the key to understanding this. In verse 11, he says, If ye then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give what? Ah, give good things. Wait a minute. Now, we have some parallelism. We got good things mentioned in Matthew 7, 11. We have the Holy Ghost over here in uh, Luke, uh, Luke uh, 13, Luke 11, 13. What is the Lord talking about? Go to Matthew, well, when he said Holy Ghost, this 
I know is going to John 7, verses 37 through 39. This, because the Lord said Holy Ghost, and this one, he is pointing to Pentecost. That's what the Lord had in mind. That's how we can know what he had in mind. Because when he said the Holy Ghost, I know he was pointing to the day of Pentecost. Yes, and how I know, because that's the day the Holy Spirit came down. But go to, go to St. John chapter 37 through 39. Let me show you. St. John 7, 37 through 39. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Look at 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So I know that he is pointing to Pentecost because the Lord had not been glorified. When he hung on that cross and he was and he, they took him down. And he was very he, he, he had to go back to the heavenly father. He went back to the glory he had before the, before the foundation of the world. So if we turn to Acts. Acts chapter 2, we find actually now the Holy Ghost coming. Okay. So, when, so when the Lord was saying the Heavenly Father would send the Holy Ghost, I know he was pointing to Pentecost when he said that. Yeah, because in Acts 2 and verse number 1 through 4, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, <clears throat> They were all uh, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were, not rolling over and falling out, and chunking babies out of the lamp, and snatching off hats and wings and all that. No, they were sitting. All right. And there appeared unto them common tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the word. And if you keep reading that, they tell you what tongues are. They came from over 17 different nationalities. Okay. A person who had the baptismal measure of the tongues could speak to you in English, and somebody sitting here can hear him in Spanish. Somebody is from Germany can hear him in Germany. And yet he's speaking one time. The Holy Spirit is that, that's a miraculous way to speak. Okay. God gave them the power to speak in all languages because he says, go ye into all the world. And Paul went through all the villages. He did all the tribes and all the places. Paul to speak their language because the Holy Spirit gave them utterance yeah. to get the gospel to those that were way out there. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And all that done didn't happen in field now. Either. But now, let's come back. So then, the good things is tied to the Holy Ghost. And we haven't asked, what is asking, knocking, and seeking? Well, let's just see. If we come to uh, Romans, well, wait a minute, Acts, we stay in Acts. If we come to Acts 2.21, when, when Peter is talking about the prophet Joel, when that is prophet, uh, that which is happening is actually Joel 2.28 to 30, coming to, coming to pass. But look what he says. And this is what he's pulling out of that. He says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall do what? Call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, what did the calling on the name of the Lord got to do with asking, knocking, and seeking? Come over to Romans chapter 10. Okay. As I try to conclude. Romans 10. In Romans 10, 